great sign appeared in the sky, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown with twelve stars. Because she was with child, she wailed aloud in pain as she labored to give birth. With these lines begin chapter 12 of the book of Revelation, also known as the Apocalypse, which documents the end times and is the last book of the Bible. Enraged at her escape, the dragon went off to make war on her offspring, on those who keep God's commandments and give witness to Jesus. He took up his position by the shore of the sea. End of chapter 12, book of Revelations. Welcome to the woman clothed with a sun. The sanctuary of what is now commonly identified as La Salette is located on the lower slopes of the French Hot Alps. From the market town of Cor, which used to be merely a halt for stage coaches, one leaves the Napoleon Highway and ascends a 15 kilometer stretch that passes the scattered hamlets the sanctuary takes its name from. The road corkscrews through the woods and valleys and one is impressed by the magnificence of mountain. In 1846, about 800 peasants lived in 10 hamlets that comprised the village of La Salette. Enclosed within a formidable ring of mountains, approximately 1800 meters above sea level, effectively isolated from the rest of the world, they lived in severe poverty, subject to a succession of bad crops and epidemics. Here, as what had become common occurrence in many parts of France, the local pastor struggled with a desolation of faith, and priests who passed through the town were often met with insults. An early account reveals that the sacraments were so utterly neglected that only two men in corps made their Easter duty, and this at a very early hour of the day to escape being mocked by their peers. On September 19, 1846, Maximo Giraud, a talkative, hyperactive child of 11, and Melanie Mathieu, a taciturn 14-year-old adolescent, both impoverished, illiterate, and barely acquainted with one another, drove their herds to pasture up the lonely heights of the Gargas. It was the day before the Catholic feast of Our Lady of Sorrows, but at that time it meant nothing to the children. That afternoon, they fell asleep in the hollow of a dried up stream and upon waking scrambled up the slope to check on their herd. Returning to the campsite, they were amazed to see a brilliant globe of light at the bottom of the ravine. They said it seemed as if the sun had fallen there. The light swirled, growing in size and opening disclosed within its midst, a woman, her face in her hands, seated in the attitude of deep grief. Maxima was later to say that the lady was like a mother beaten by her children who escaped to the mountain to cry. When he tried to explain the nature of the light, he said it was more brilliant than the sun and that there were not one but two globes of light, one which completely enveloped the lady and one which was the lady herself. Then the lady rose and with arms crossed over her breast and head slightly inclined, faced them and said in French, Come near, my children. Be not afraid. I have great news. The children only spoke the local dialect, but understood that the lady was beckoning. And so they approached her gingerly, coming so near that in Maxima's words, no one could pass between the lady and themselves. They described her as being garbed in a long robe, apron, shawl, and a cap or what seemed to be a headdress that held her hair. A tiara of brilliant light emanated from the top of her head, which was crowned with many colored roses that also adorned the edges of her shawl and her gold buckled shoes. From the centers of the roses, there were what seemed to be flames, which rose up like incense and mingled with the light, and from between them extended what looked like branches of pearls. A heavy chain which fascinated Melanie because of its lace-like appearance rested on her shoulders and from a smaller chain around her neck hung a crucifix with a hammer and pincers on either side of the crossbeam. Many years later, upon being shown an artist's rendition of the Lady of La Salette, Maxima declared that the headdress, mantle and clothing represented in the picture were really not clothing but light and that what attracted him most was the cross, for it stood out as did the luminous figure of the Christ. 
Her tears fell continuously, and as she spoke, her voice was so sweet that according to Maxima, it seemed he fed on it. And though they hardly understood her, the words were engraved in their minds. If my people will not submit, I shall be forced to let fall the arm of my son. It is so strong, so heavy, that I can no longer withhold it. For how long a time do I suffer for you? If I would not have my son abandon you, I am compelled to pray to him without ceasing. And as to you, you take not heed of it. However much you pray, however much you do, you will never recompense the pains I have taken for you. Six days I have given you labor, the seventh I have kept for myself, and they will not give it to me. It is this which makes the arm of my son so heavy. Those who drive the carts cannot swear without introducing the name of my son. These are the two things which make the arm of my son so heavy. If the harvest is spoiled, it is all on your account. I gave you warning last year with the potatoes, but you did not heed it. On the contrary, when you found the potatoes spoiled, you swore you took the name of my son in vain. That will continue to decay, so that by Christmas there will be none left. Melanie, who did not quite understand the lady's words, turned questioningly to Maxima. The lady seemed to notice this, for she said, Ah, my children, you do not understand? Well, wait, I shall say it otherwise. And continued, but this time speaking in the local dialect. If you have wheat, it is no good to sow it. All you sow, the insects will eat, and what comes up will fall into dust when you thresh it. Then she began to foretell grave events. There will come a great famine. Before the famine comes, the children under seven years of age will be seized with trembling and will die in the hands of those who hold them. The others will do penance by the famine. The walnuts will become bad and the grapes will rot. After this, she addressed the children separately, confiding to each a secret. Although both saw the lady's lips move, one could not hear what the other was told. Then she continued and addressed them both. If they are converted, the stones and rocks will change into mounds of wheat and the potatoes will be self-sown in the land. Do you say your prayers well, my children? Melanie and Maxima admitted they did not. Ah, my children, you must be sure to say them well, morning and evening. When you cannot do better, say at least an Our Father and a Hail Mary. But when you have time, say more. There are none who go to Mass except a few aged women. The rest work on Sunday all summer. Then in the winter, when they know not what to do, they go to Mass only to mock at religion. Have you ever seen wheat that is spoiled, my children? Melanie and Maxima replied that they had not, but the lady insisted that Maxima had, proceeding to narrate with amazing accuracy the day he and his father went to a farm at Quang, where two ears of wheat had crumbled to dust in his hands. And his father gave him a piece of bread and said, Here, my child, Eat some bread this year at least. I don't know who will eat any next year if the wheat goes on like that. The lady's narrative was so precise that Maxima instantly remembered the day in question. Reverting back to French, she said, Well, my children, you will make this known to all my people. And turning to her left, passed in front of the children, gliding across the ravine, not touching the earth or grass, tracing what Maxima later described as the outline of a letter M in her circuits. Without turning or stopping, she repeated her request. Well, my children, you will make this known to all my people. The children, realizing that she had drawn further away from them, scampered after her, and together they ascended the hillock with a lady gliding over the grass. Upon reaching the summit, she rose up in the air to a height of a meter and a half and remained thus suspended, eyes raised towards heaven, then towards the southeast. Melanie then noticed that she had ceased to weep. She began to vanish. First her head, then her body seemed to melt away. The great light lingered, as did the roses which Maxima tried, but failed to catch in his hands. The children looked for a long time hoping that the lady would return, but she was not to be seen again. Melanie commented to Maxima that perhaps they had seen a great saint, 
To which Maxima replied, If we had known it was a great saint, we would have asked her to take us with her. At dusk, the children descended to the village, and it was the light-hearted Maxima who informed both of their employers about the events that transpired. And soon the children were surrounded and questioned. Even the normally sullen and unsociable Melanie responded to their queries, and all were amazed to hear both children recite the ladies' messages in French, for it was common knowledge that neither of them had any command of the language. Years later, Maxima was to recall that though he could only speak the French-Italian dialect, after he came down from the mountain, he was able to converse and answer in fluent French all the questions put to him. That night, though she hardly knew any prayers, Melanie was on her knees, and the next morning, the two were sent to the village pastor. Owing perhaps to the great ignorance of the two shepherds, an ignorance that ruled out the possibility of invention, Father Peran believed the visionaries instantly. With the exception of the parish priest of Poma, this reaction would be most uncommon among the parish priests of subsequent apparitions. Choking back his tears, the pastor made it the subject of a stirring sermon in his next mass, and soon the entire village was filled with talk of the lady in tears, and the poor shepherds suddenly thrust into the public eye. Thus, with the great news of La Salette, began a series of controversial public apparitions that would reoccur well into the final years of the 20th century. The sensational nature of the message ensured its propagation, and it was controversial to say the least, for even the Minister of Public Health demanded that the bishop denounce the entire affair, and in an account of his visit in 1863 to the Congregation of the Holy Cross, Maxima related that King Louis Philippe feared that the prophecy relating to the corn and potatoes was invented for the purpose of raising the price of these products, and he sent an official to investigate and arrest the children. Melanie and Maxima were detained, harassed, mocked, and subjected to continuous questioning from civil authorities, journalists, pilgrims, and representatives of the church. But they remained firm, ignored all threats, and refused all bribes. Although they often had disagreements because of the notable differences in their character, they were one with regards to the apparition, and until their death, were never to retract or contradict any of the facts of their common account. Prior to the event of La Salette, those who had been favored with apparitions were from religious orders, and with the exception of Juan Diego of Guadalupe fame, they were merely the object of rumor and not of scrutiny, as was the case of the visionary of the miraculous medal. Now, all of a sudden, the public had, for the first time, access to actual visionaries, could see them, hear them, and touch them. From that time on, all such apparitions would be characterized by crowds who would besiege those whom they thought had been privileged with a glimpse of eternity. The message of the lady began to have an effect. People began to scale the mountain in amazing numbers to pray at the ravine and draw water which had begun to flow from the once dried up spring. Among the villages of La Salette and neighboring towns, violation of the Sunday rest ceased and there was an increase in attendance at mass. Swearing and blasphemy were suppressed and pilgrimages to La Salette had also sprung up quite spontaneously. Numerous conversions were also reported. La Salette was quickly beginning to acquire a reputation for the conversion of the most hardened sinners. One of the first was Monsieur Giraud, who though at first angry and disbelieving of what he considered his son's prank, was touched when the boy later revealed the lady's knowledge of the forgotten incident at Quang. He too ascended the mountain, drank from the spring, and was instantly healed of his asthma. In a year's time, 
100,000 pilgrims had been to La Salette, and on the first anniversary of the apparition, 60,000 people made their way up steep mountain paths that were as yet impractical for wagons. But even more astounding were the rapid succession of reports of miraculous cures of the blind, lame, dying, causing a sensation not only in France, but all over Europe as well. 23 miraculous cures attributed to the intercession of the Lady of La Salette were documented and examined by the commission assigned by the Bishop of Grenoble. The church had remained silent and in an effort to keep its distance had almost immediately transferred the old Abbe Perron away from the parish and replaced him with a younger priest of the same family name. But on September 19, 1851, after five years of intense persistent inquiry, Bishop Brouillard of Grenoble declared as authentic the apparition of the Blessed Virgin to the two children on a mountain in the chain of Alps in the parish of La Salette. It was not an easy decision for the bishop to make, and he had hesitated to do so, for religion had by now become a very sensitive subject, and at times could not be considered apart from political issues. Aside from this, the liberal and rationalistic press had a field day mocking and bitterly attacking what it considered a return to outdated church practice. It bewailed the ignorance of a people who, in an age of scientific truth, acknowledged such superstitious medieval notions. But the entire countryside had been stirred. And surprisingly enough, a few weeks earlier, a petition had been drawn up and signed by 140 persons of the clergy requesting the bishop to declare in favor of the apparition. This, even though some had already been affected by so-called advanced ideas of faith that later became known as modernism. Only 21 years had elapsed since the Virgin had appeared to the unidentified visionary of the miraculous medal. And in her lifetime, Catherine Labore was to see the effect of the lady's promise to always keep an eye on her children. But unlike Catherine, and much later Bernadette Subiru, who would be the visionary of Lourdes, the two children did not go on to become saints, at least not in the sense it is now commonly referred to. But the original translation of the word was derived from the early Christian martyrs and meant witness, one who by his or her actions bore witness to the truth of Christ. And if used in this sense, despite the world's perception that they were failures, then the lives of Melanie and Maxima were testimonies of this truth. They had completed their mission, had done as the lady had asked, were nothing more than channels, and in doing so had been thrust from obscurity into the limelight to become the focus of controversy as well as of overwhelming adulation. In the four years that they were subjected to almost ceaseless interrogation, they were hardly ever on their own. Sent to be educated by the nuns, they had great difficulty with their catechetical instruction. But mystified interrogators with their deep theological insights, for example, when it was suggested that they had been deceived by the devil, Maxima simply replied that the devil did not have a crucifix and would not forbid blasphemy. Melanie also replied that the devil would not carry a cross. And when the priest interrogating her retorted that the devil had carried Jesus onto the mountain and the temple and could very well carry his cross, the 14-year-old with great assurance replied, No, monsieur, no. God would not let him carry his cross like that. It was on the cross that he died. It is on the cross that he saved the world. However, they both had great difficulty handling the bewildering succession of events. Neither of them ever married and had to suffer all their lives from close scrutiny of their characters and oftentimes endured public dissection of their faults and failures. Maxima struggled with the impetuous excesses of his temperament. As a child, he was so hyperactive that even during the conversation with a lady, he couldn't keep still. He kept taking his hat off, putting it on again, 
and spinning it around on his stick and even kicking at the stones around the lady with his foot. Talkative, restless, and incapable of sustained concentration, he entered but found he had no vocation to the priesthood. He then traveled to Paris and elsewhere in attempts to study or try several other lines of work, none of which amounted to anything. A spendthrift and careless with money, he tried to keep his identity a secret but was often exploited. However, despite his faults, he impressed others by his humility devotion to prayer and purity, for he had a horror of indecent language, double-meaning words and jokes. In his struggles with temptation and despair, he declared that the remembrance of the apparition gave him the strength of God, as did his daily rosary and devotion to Saint Joseph. Though burdened with debt, he refused to accept money forced on him by pilgrims, for he did not sell the words which the beautiful lady told me to make known to all her people. He returned to the village of Kor, suffering from nervous asthma and heart disease. He died a poor man with a mountain of debt at the age of 40. His devotion to his beautiful lady never wavered, and even after death in his last will and testament, he attested that he had never retracted the great event of La Salette and bequeathed his heart to her. Melanie's life was far more controversial. Uncommunicative and morose as a child, it would be easy to dismiss her as a crabby and overbearing woman, for she had many detractors. But there are so many conflicting reports of her personality that one suspects that she too had great difficulty and wrestled with the dark side of her character. She flitted in and out of various religious congregations, and it was said that having grown used to being the center of attention, she resented the clergy's failure to perceive and proclaim her personal importance. In what seemed to be an attempt to attract attention, she made up stories of her past and later claimed to receive other divine messages. She also allowed herself to be exploited and manipulated by her various spiritual directors, publishing a written account of the apparition which included what she claimed was a secret entrusted to her by the Virgin and alleged that she had been instructed to keep it secret only till 1858. This was a far contrast from her attitude as a young girl, when with amazing strength of character and tenacity, she refused to divulge the secret. One wonders if this had finally become a burden, as she often wrote and spoke of apocalyptic events to come. Somewhat paranoid, she became a wanderer, and traveled to England and then Italy and died there in 1904 while dressing to go to Mass which she attended daily. However, like Maxima, her purity too was unquestioned and she impressed others with her tender piety, ascetism and spirit of penance. Perhaps Maxima had summarized their lives best when after telling a group of pilgrims about the lady he lamented and said, she was raised up and disappeared, and left me, I, with all my shortcomings. But what about the secrets? Accounts say that it had only taken Maxima a few minutes to write his down, and that afterwards he threw the paper in the air and joyfully exclaimed that he was now completely free. For if anyone had any questions, they could ask the Pope. However, Melanie had taken a much longer time and her secrets covered three closely written pages. While writing, she asked what infallibly meant and how it was spelled, and also asked how to spell polluted cities and antichrist. Those present when Pius IX read their letters stated that while Maximus amused him, Melanie's caused him to puff out his cheeks, compress his lips, and say, There are dangers that threaten France, but France is not the only guilty one. So is Italy, Germany, the whole earth. I have less to fear from open impiety than indifference. It is not for nothing that the church is called militant, and here you see its leader. Because of this, there was speculation that the secrets had influenced the course of events within the church. 
perhaps a post-mortem of that period may shed some light on this. By the time the Pope had received the secrets, the Catholic Church had again undergone tremendous persecution and change. This time, much of the focus was on the person of the Pope himself and the role of the papacy. The popular and newly elected Pius IX had been considered a liberal who believed in free institutions. Moreover, he was regarded as an Italian nationalist and worked for the unification of Italy. But he was also a devoted priest and was soon torn between his patriotism and his religion. National sentiment wanted him to declare war against Austria and he spent hours in prayer agonizing over the divergence of his two duties and finally decided to give full account of his stewardship to the Catholics of the world and secure the unity of the church. This, of course, made him unpopular with his countrymen. And two years after the apparition at La Salette, in October of 1848, the premier of the Papal States was assassinated and on November 16, Italian nationalists led by Freemasons, Marxists and free thinkers marched on the Quirinale, then the offices of the Pope, with demands that would deprive him of all power to protect the temporal interests of the Church and compel him into declaring war. He, of course, was constrained to resist, but was deserted by all of his ministers except for two cardinals and the representatives of all foreign embassies in Rome who willingly risked their lives in a display of moral support. By the time the mob arrived, there was no one to protect them except for a dozen carabinieri and a company of Swiss guards whose commanding officer presented himself to the Pope and offered with his men to defend him to the death. After the attack, the Pope was practically a prisoner until November 24th, when with the aid of the French ambassador and dressed as an ordinary priest, he escaped through a secret passage and was able to leave Rome for the safety of Neapolitan territory. He had tried to be modern, liberal, and progressive, and though he explored all possible directions, his experiment failed, cost him the loss of temporal power, and left him disillusioned and antagonistic towards the liberalism of the day. His worst fears were fully realized, for in the next 18 months, there would be bloodshed in nearly all the capitals of Europe, this violence extended even up and down secondary towns and all sorts of crises, national, social, racial and political, seemed to erupt all at once. The armies of the Second French Republic were victorious in their bid to restore him to power and he returned to Rome in 1850. On July 18, 1851, he received the secrets of the shepherds of La Salette. In 1854, in the papal bull in a fabulous deus, he declared the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception, which laid a solid foundation for the veneration of Mary. And though he had lost temporal power, he strengthened his spiritual authority, convened the First Vatican Council, and in 1870, the dogma of papal infallibility was declared. This doctrine taught that when the Pope was speaking with authority on matters of faith and morals, he was guided by the Holy Spirit and could not err. What is intriguing is that the accounts of Melanie inquiring about the word infallibly as she wrote the secret were recorded in 1851, 19 years prior to the declaration of the dogma. Years later, when the superior of the Lasselet missionaries, in a private audience with the Pope, inquired about the secrets, the Pope replied, So you want to know the secrets of Lasselet? Well, here they are. Unless you do penance, you will all perish. The following are excerpts taken from the brochure that Melanie was supposed to have had printed in 1879 at Lecce, Italy, with the approval of the bishop.
grip on the secrets. Melanie had written them down three times in three different periods and supposedly each time there were changes that would reflect the style of her current spiritual director. It is thought that she wrote to please them. In 1880, the Holy Office had ordered Melanie's book to be withdrawn, but the First World War revived interest in the secret, so it was republished in 1922. And in 1923, it was placed on what was then the index of condemned books and writings that the Holy Office declared to be contrary to faith or morals or discreditable to the Catholic Church. However, in 1966, in the reign of Paul VI, the index was declared to no longer have the force of law in the church and Melanie's secret was back in circulation. Her actions and that of Maxima had no bearing on the authenticity of the apparition, for it was proven that they hadn't lied about the afternoon's event. And when they left ordinary topics of conversation and spoke of the apparition, their transformation impressed everyone. But one wonders if all of Melanie's so-called allegations of divine messages afterwards were really the invention of an insecure mind. For there survives an old account which said she claimed that aside from receiving messages, she also would see her guardian angel and receive spiritual communion. At that time, it was thought to be blasphemous. But curiously enough, these happened to be events that would occur in some of the other apparitions that followed, such as Fatima, Akita, and even in Garabandal, which has just been reopened for investigation. Throughout the years, pilgrimages to La Salette continued, and the Bishop of Grenoble decided that there was a need for a religious order to attend to the needs of the sanctuary, and so was born the community of La Salette Fathers, the only religious community at that time to be named after an apparition of Mary. The stones for the church were extracted from the mountain and all the work was completed by 1865. In 1879, the church received the title of Basilica from Pope Leo XIII. Today, La Salette still remains a haven for the confused, the sick, and troubled of the weary world. Father Roger Castell thinks that the Virgin is dressed in accordance with the message that she wants to transmit, and that since in La Salette she speaks essentially of her son, and declares that she suffers and prays for us without ceasing, then it is but natural that she appear as a mother. In relation to this, the unusual crucifix she wears signifies that there is a choice to be made between the hammer that crucifies Christ and the pincers that liberate, just as there is also a choice between the chains and the roses. He comments on the lady's controversial statement regarding holding back the arm of her son. It is very important what you are saying because all of our religion is being questioned or in question. What idea do we have of God? Is God a God who judges and strikes, who sends miseries? Or else is God a father? In La Salette, you have to read closely what the Blessed Virgin says. She does not say, I will hold back the arm of my son. She says, I will sustain, that is, to help him. I will maintain, support, help God's hand. I cannot help anymore if you do not convert. All my efforts will be useless. In the Bible, every time you speak of the arm of God that is deployed, it is to save his people. And all those who oppose are discarded. That's the thing, first and foremost, that's essential. Here, with the pilgrims that we meet, our work is precisely to make the pilgrims pass from the idea of a God who sends catastrophe, who judges, to an idea of God who loves, to a father who waits, who expects love on our part. One who invites us to a great liberty, a great freedom. We have to distinguish very well what we mean by liberty. There's liberty that current idea says, I'll do what I want, what I want, just when I want it, and that liberty is false. There's liberty that makes us more human, and that is true liberty. If after having done something I am more human than before, 
then that's real liberty. In this domain, we are not in the domain of laws. We are in the domain of an interior choice. And it's at that point that Our Lady invites us. There is something characteristic about La Salette. She never speaks of God. She speaks always of her son. She puts before our eyes the life, death, the resurrection of Christ, and she tells us, live in his way. Live according to the life of Christ, to imitate Christ. But to know the gospel is to see what were the choices of Jesus, to enter into this way, not to judge, to welcome, to receive, to heal, and so forth. She says, if I would not have my son abandon you, I am compelled to pray to him without ceasing. I understand that prayer is the most powerful force in the world. However, why is it specifically the phrase, if I would not have my son abandon you? Is it possible then that without her prayers he would abandon us? Or that without our prayers he would abandon us? I think that this part of the sentence is the most shocking. God loves always his people. But the people are very changeable towards him. And all the time God says in the Bible, because my people have abandoned me, because my people have sinned, I cannot do anything because I gave them liberty. And what I have given, I never take back. Thus, God becomes powerless before our freedom when we freely refuse God. And I think it is in this sense that we must understand these words. Jesus, son of Mary, cannot do anything for us if not abandon us at the moment we refuse. If we refuse his love, he cannot do anything for us. We spoke of human liberty, and I think we have an extraordinary power, and it is to make a failure of God. God gave us liberty, but if we refuse his love, God now becomes totally powerless. There's always a problem of our liberty or our freedom. God respects us infinitely. He never obliges us, no matter what. But he tells us, and he makes us know, that he loves us. That he loves us, especially when we are in difficulties and trials. But because he has given us our liberty, it is for us to prove our love. Father Roger believes that God's continuing love for us is at the heart of the Lasalet message. For the reminder on the spoiled wheat and the piece of bread was about an incident that Mary had never forgotten, but which Maxima's father forgot. He then realized that God watched over him, even in his anxiety as a father, as head of the family. Monsieur Giraud, le père de Maxima. Monsieur Giraud, Maxima's father, understood the most important thing, that God loves him, even though he had forgotten God. Another shocking thing about her message is the phrase where she speaks of the seventh day for herself and how it will not be given to her. Is that not presumptuous? It is not a problem that seems hard from the beginning. All the time the prophets spoke, they spoke in the name of God. And very often in the Bible they speak in the first person. Everyone knows that it's not the prophets who speak. It is God who speaks to the prophets. When Our Lady says, I have given you six days to work, and I keep the seventh for myself, we know that she is the mouthpiece of God. The rest on the seventh day is a present problem that is being discussed in all of the West, because our society, our consumer society, has encircled us, has put us in a vicious circle. Produce, consume, produce, consume. And there is no rest for them. In the newspapers this last month, there was a lot of discussion on the fact that we are on the road to destroying man because we did not respect his time of rest and his time of work. When you read the message, do you take the whole thing as the voice of God? Where then does it separate the Virgin as the mother of God or the mother from the voice of God? There is no separation in the sense that the Virgin here is the messenger of God. She has the role of a prophet. You know that Jesus in the Gospel lived as a prophet and spoke as a prophet. And for that he was crucified. The wise, well, them we never crucify because the wise always finds a compromise. But when we say the word of God in all its vigor, then we disturb a lot of people. The Virgin speaks to us in the name of God like a prophet. 
and she leaves this word of God not as an order or a menace. On the contrary, she leaves this word to freedom, and she implores us to open our eyes to reality. The sanctuary and hostelry are open all year round, and the Association of Pilgrims of La Salette can accommodate more than 800 pilgrims in bedrooms, dormitories, and dining rooms. Part of the stone on which the lady sat is displayed in the basilica, other fragments having long been carried away as relics. The message, too, has been carried by the missionaries of La Salette from the congregations in Europe, America, Africa, India, Madagascar, and the Philippines. And on summer nights, the solitude of the mountains is interrupted by the echo of voices that sing out a response to the call of the woman in tears. Although apparitions are considered private revelation and the Catholic faithful are not obliged to believe in them, one cannot dismiss their impact on Catholics and non-Catholics alike. And on hindsight, it is interesting to note that as in Guadalupe, their influence on historical events cannot be ignored. Records offer proof of the fulfillment of the prophecies of the Lady of La Salette. The winter of 1846 was unusually severe, and in the canton of Cor, potatoes were scarce, and by Christmas, there were none left. Wheat was costly, and bread became so rare that rough bran was used as a substitute. At the opening of the English Parliament in January of 1847, Queen Victoria reported that the potato famine in Ireland, which had begun the year before, the year of the apparition, had been so severe that the loss of this staple crop had caused a terrible increase in the loss of lives. In 1849, the vines withered and walnuts and chestnuts, which were a staple food, became moldy throughout France. And in 1854, there was an outbreak of cholera which was complicated by fever, and little children everywhere were seized with a violent chill, trembled all over and died after two or three hours of agony. In 1856, the French newspaper Constitutionnel reported that though the complete list of deaths in 1855 had not yet been completed, the deaths of at least 80,000 persons were caused by the high price of food. In other words, starvation. And conservative estimates report that throughout Europe from 1854 to 1856, as many as one million persons died of the same cause. Thus, the lady's admonitions unfortunately proved to be true and gave just cause for her tears to fall. In the last part of that century and on to the next, the prophecies that we know of that were revealed were also fulfilled as exemplified by those of Fatima. Initially, the apparitions seemed to be isolated incidents related only to events within the locality of the apparition site. However, as they progress, patterns emerge, designs surface, taking form, expanding, growing in clarity and detail with every apparition until bit by bit, as we will see, a stupendous tapestry emerges, vivid, startling, and compelling. While the themes of prayer and penance for oneself and for others will continue to resound with increasing urgency, so likewise will the theme of hope. For the Virgin will here on in manifest herself in the darkest periods of human history, holding out in anguished times the hope of salvation through prayer and conversion. Come to the foot of the altar. Here great graces will be poured out upon all who ask for them with confidence and fervor, they will be bestowed upon the great and the small. To a world bent on its own destruction, she will offer again and again refuge in prayer and in a life lived in union with God. For this was the great news of La Salette. If they are converted, the stones and rocks will change into mounds of wheat and the potatoes will be self-sown in the land. Well, my children, you will make this known to all my people. This is June Keithley 
for the first of the series of The Woman Clothed with a Sun.